Uh, our next uh, speaker today is uh, Alison Christians. Uh, she is the H. H. Eward Steichman Chair, is that correct? In tax law at McGill University uh, of Law, where she teaches and uh, writes to on topics of national and international tax law and policy. So that means we'll have another uh, aspect of this big, uh, big topic of, of the day uh, and more about the, the legal issues. Uh, the uh, presentation is called Le Legal Circumventions, When Does the Form Have to Give Way to the Substance in Tax Matter? So, uh, uh, Ms. Christians, um, please. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here and uh, to be addressing this crowd. Uh, and you're a tough act to follow because I think you just to really show just really how compelling the, the, the evasion uh, picture is. And so actually, I'm very happy that I come after you because we can start from this premise that we've already seen tax evasion as a major compliance issue and tax havens as impediments to effective taxation right? With a combination of low tax and secrecy and the U.S. being an obvious uh, uh, leader, unfortunately, in this field. And what I want to do is switch the focus just a little bit and think about how legal structures currently in place contribute to the problem even when we take compliance off the table. In other words, I want to say, how do we use legal forms to achieve the same ends, that is money just disappearing, without violating the rules in play? To put it one more way, how do we disappear money perfectly legally? And the reason, one of the reasons I'm animated by this question is that the more stories we have about multinational corporations dodging tax all over the world, the answer is always the same. We are fully compliant. We are fully compliant. And so I think when you have a world of full compliance, what are we after? with publish what you pay? What are we after with country by country reporting? And I think if we t start to look at the legal structures that get us to full compliance and no taxation, we'll get even a bigger picture that includes this tax evasion issue, but also includes non-evasion as a major problem that we also have to solve. Okay. So as we go, as I go through this, I'll go give you a series of slides um, with an example. And what I'm going to suggest is that, uh, yeah, I was given the topic of form versus substance, and what I'm going to suggest is, is perhaps provocative, is that the form is the substance, and the substance is in the form, because it's all a question of legal structure. It's all a question of legal forms that we respect. And out of history, or path dependence, or our ideas about what can the state do, or what does the state do, what can people do, how should, what is a corporation, that we get to a place we didn't necessarily expect. Okay. Um, and one of the things I think that it's worth, will, uh, worth reminding ourselves is that when we practice the same thing every day, it becomes normal. And we forget that what we're doing is highly abnormal. And it's worth taking another look to see how did we get to this very strange place where we are through a series of things that have now become normalized to us. Okay, so that's a theme also. All right, so I'm going to start with a very simple example uh, with Google. Now, Google is fully compliant with a worldwide tax rate of about 2.4%. Fully compliant. And uh, if any of you were paying attention to the PAC, the, the Public Accounts Commission in the UK, Google was on the uh, hot seat along with uh, Starbucks, uh, Amazon, uh, trying to explain away these, uh, these odd structures. And so what I'm going to say right here is this. I'm gonna, we're going to go through the Google structure. I'm going to eliminate a lot of nonsense, right? That I'm, I'm going to oversimplify the structure just to make a very basic point, OK? And I want to keep in mind, this is just one structure. And you name what you want to do, and there's another structure to get you there, OK? So this is just one example. And I'm a tax academic, so what I do is try to break something down to the most simple element to focus on the one thing that I want to focus on, which is to say that I'm going to eliminate necessary pieces of this uh, of the structure. And I'm also going to make some assumptions that I can't <coughs> prove, because I'm not 
in-house at Google doing their tax planning, okay? So there can be mistakes. Uh, there can be assumptions that aren't correct. And what I will say is that it actually doesn't matter, right? That is, even if we get some of the details a uh, little fuzzy or we have to revisit some of the pieces of it, it still is going to show, I think, this very basic question about legal form and, uh, and substance. All right, so we use Google. We'll start with Google. How, and the question is how to make income disappear without breaking any laws. Okay, so we start with Google. Google Inc. is a U.S. company incorporated, of course, in Delaware. Uh, although, as you may know, it's working in California. So there's already a little oddity going on there. But we'll leave that aside. U.S. company incorporated in the U.S. And we'll start from a pro uh, presumption. If Google sold what it sells, which is 90% advertising, if it sold what it sold on a worldwide basis, all of its income would be taxed in the U.S. currently at a top rate of 35%, right? Just make that assumption. But Google doesn't do that, right? Uh, it needs to make income disappear, so it goes, quote, offshore. All right, so step one, to make income disappear, you need to incorporate a subsidiary offshore. We'll call this GIH, Google Ireland Holdings. We'll call it GIH. We'll incorporate it in Ireland. Why are we going to Ireland? Because Ireland is friendly to IP. That's all. We could choose any number of jurisdictions. We'll choose Ireland. Ireland's friendly. What's the form here? Well, you set up a legal person. And both countries respect that. That's normal. It's normal to say that Google Ireland Holdings is a separate person from Google US. And that Google Ireland Holdings has a capacity to think and to negotiate and to act separate from Google US. It's normal to think this way because we believe that incorporation is substance. There is substance to it. OK, so the form here is we file a paper in Ireland to make a company. You showed us the, how easy that is. Uh, and what we know is that Google Ireland Holdings will hire some people, and it's going to be the management of uh, EMEA, right? Europe, Middle East, and Africa for Google. OK, uh, so the form is operating in Ireland. GIH is separate. GIH can negotiate. It has a mind of its own. It's independent. And in general, if we stopped right here, active income earned by Google, Google Ireland Holdings is not normally taxed in the US. That is, if Google Ireland Holdings goes out and produces products or sells and has income from business, the US normally will not tax that right away. It won't tax it until GIH pays a dividend to Google US, or Google US sells its shares, in which case we trigger some US tax, OK, normally. But if GIH has what we call passive income, royalties, rents, interest, that in some cases would be taxed by the US currently. OK, just uh, some complicated rules we don't need to go into. So what happens between these two companies? Well, we are going to transfer valuable intangibles to Google Ireland Holdings by means of something called a cost sharing agreement. Now, you don't have to know everything about a cost sharing agreement. All you have to believe here is that Google Ireland Holdings is a partner to develop an intangible that it's going to, it's going to contribute. And together, Google Inc. US and Google Ireland Holdings together, working together, will share the cost of producing whatever it is they produce. And that each is an independent actor in that contract. And that each has negotiated that contract. And the means of our checking on their negotiation, of course, you know, uh, is arm's length transfer pricing, right? We'll take an arm's length transfer pricing. We'll say, did they act at arm's length? And if not, we may have to adjust it. Uh, but the form is a legal contract transferring rights from Google US to <coughs> GIH, a legal contract. That's the form. And what's the substance? Well, it's hard to say. Because Google Ireland Holdings is a holdings company. So it's not necessarily doing anything that you and I can watch. We don't, what do holding companies do? We don't really know. So it turns out that 
we're going to have most of our directors' meetings and management and so on in Bermuda. And now we come to a funny place. Uh, once the mine and management is in Bermuda, it's no longer in Ireland. Now, it has been suggested by some looking at this structure that Ireland no longer sees us as an Irish company once the mine and management is offshore. I don't, I'm not an expert on Irish tax law, but I looked at the Irish tax authorities' website, and they seem to suggest that they're an incorporation model, form, formalistic, like the US. You are where you are incorporated. You are where your piece of paper says you are. Unlike some other countries, which say you are where your mind and management are. Okay, so it's a little unclear to me whether it's really true that this disappears for Ireland's purposes. This is the position that uh, some academics in looking at this structure have taken. Uh, and for our purposes, we'll take that position too. It, doesn't, it sort of doesn't matter too much at the end of the day, as long as it's not US. But we'll just take this position that once we've moved this uh, mine and management to Bermuda, it's now a Bermuda uh, company from the US perspective. Uh, and from Ireland's perspective. Uh, sorry, it's a, it's a Bermuda company from Ireland's perspective, but from the US perspective, it's still an Irish company because it's incorporated in Ireland. Okay, so far so good. So that's uh, step three. Step four, let's uh, incor incorporate another cell. Let's put this one in the Netherlands. Well, why are we putting it in Netherlands? Well, this is our finance tax haven or tax jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, lawyers and consultants and so on. And the Netherlands is going to um, like Google's presence and encourage Google's presence. And in fact, uh, you'll see, if you look at the P, the PAC, uh, the Public Accounts Commission inquiry, you'll find out that uh, Google Netherlands, Google BV in the Netherlands, has a confidential agreement with the government, which the government of Netherlands has told Google not to divulge. The government of the Netherlands has told them. I don't know of any confidentiality law that protects an agreement between uh, the government of the Netherlands and Google uh, BV in the Netherlands. And the, C the, the vice president of European operations wasn't sure either. He had to go back and check. He would let the PAC know whether that was really confidential or what could he, what could he tell you. What we're going to do here in the Netherlands is we're going to license the IP that we got through our cost sharing agreement, we're going to license that into the Netherlands, right? And that's going to create an obligation for royalties to be paid up, right? Once we license, we get royalties. Okay, so what's the form? Again, it's another contract that transfers rights and obligations among two parties who are respected because they are corporate entities, right? Okay. So uh, form is incorporation. Uh, the form is a contract, and the substance is I'm not sure we have to, we can necessarily say at this stage. Okay. Now, uh, incorporate another sub. Final, this is the last piece in our puzzle. I know it's getting complicated, but Google, we're back in Ireland again. Now, we're back in Ireland again. Why? Well, this is where the jobs are going to be in Google Ireland Limited. <laughs> this is the sales guys who are going to go all, all around Europe, Middle East, and Africa and sell Google advertising to customers. These are, this is the actual active business going on. And why is it in Ireland? Well, it's a good place for this kind of thing. Again, we have a, uh, it's an attractive, what we call non-harmful tax competition, right? A low tax rate. Uh, but it's on wages and, uh, and on the corporate income. And I mean, there's no kind of evasion going on here. It's just, it's real the substance here. It's the people on the ground, on the phone, uh, who are selling this product. All right, so, but for them to do that, we obviously have to sub-license again, and that creates, again, a royalty stream going up, okay? Uh, and, again, to, to give people the rights so that they can sell the thing that they're obligated to. So, again, what's the form? We have contracts, again, allocating rights and obligations. We have corporations treated as entities, treated as persons, and given rights. Uh, and the substance is that, in fact, now we have these people that are doing this job. But it's not to say there aren't people in the Netherlands or people in Bermuda or elsewhere. There are people at each of those levels. That's precisely why each of the governments wants to encourage the incorporation of each of these entities, because there are jobs being traded here uh, around the globe. Okay, so the last thing, 
The last piece of this uh, structure that you need to understand is that these two at the bottom are not, uh, they're a little, it's a little unclear what is the, f what should the form really be? And so in the US, you just can check the box to treat them as if they don't exist at all, right? Treat them as a disregarded entity. Now, let's just think about that, because this is a very interesting place where form and substance flip on their heads in an unexpected way. Because the form is two corporations completely owned above in the chain and contracts between them, and the substance is nothing. And so in this case, you would say the US rule, the US allows you to check the box, treat them as disregard, is actually getting at the substance of the transaction here, is actually getting at the substance in that it's ignoring intercompany transfers that totally net each other out. So there's nothing wrong, really, on paper, with the check the box rules as applied here. It's doing the right thing. It's ignoring form to concentrate on the substance, which is that everything's controlled above in Google Ireland holdings. Okay. So we have a number of form and substance elements here. And I would say each one of them is contestable. But let's just uh, look at what we've accomplished before we start testing what in the world is going on here. What happens on paper? Well, what happens on paper in this structure is that Google Ireland Limited has those, that sales force. Now, 2,000 people working in Ireland who would not be there necessarily, right, if Google was selling directly from uh, Silicon Valley. So 2,000 or so people selling products, services to customers. In Google's case, advertising. They pay the royalties up. The royalties comes in, the royalties go out. The royalties go in, the CSA fees, the cost sharing agreement fees go out. And the CSA fees show up here. Okay, that's what happens on paper. Now let's take this and disaggregate it a little bit. Okay. Let's start with the US. Well, what does the US see as happening here? Well, the US doesn't see those two at all, right? That's the substance of it, that there's nothing going on. It's intercompany arrangements that should be disregarded. So the royalties and licenses are ignored. And what you have is a Bermuda branch of an Ireland company from the US perspective, in one of you. The thing is, since everything is attributed to Google Ireland Holdings, all of that passive income underneath it disappears. And it's the active sales income that happened in Ireland that is attributed to Google Ireland, Ireland Holdings by the US. Which means that that income, as I said before, won't be taxed in the US unless Google Ireland Holdings pays a dividend up to its shareholder, Google US, or Google US sells its shares in GIH. OK. So the business income now, active business income, not passive income, it sits in Bermuda. And it waits for a present from the US Congress. And the present is repatriation holiday, OK? We'll come back to that in a minute. But in the meantime, if you need to pay share, uh, if you need to pay dividends, you can pull a little bit of this income up and out of Ireland. It will have a foreign tax credit attached to it. And you can maybe mix it with some of your other income from other similar transactions across your multinational structure and get a tax efficient cash flow up through Google US and out to its shareholders who are demanding. OK. And the final thing that the US sees is the CSA fees, which are subject to a transfer pricing, an advanced pricing agreement, <coughs> which, of course, we don't have any access to. I don't know what the price is. I don't know what has been agreed to. OK. So you might see the US as a bit of a shape shifter here. Now you see it, now you don't kind of thing. Well there, were, well, there were two companies here, but we don't see them anymore. But it's not a question of which one is right, form or substance. Right? We can't answer that question. It's, but nevertheless, what we have is that the income has disappeared from the, from the US. All right, well, what about Ireland? What does Ireland see? Well, Ireland doesn't really see anything above the Netherlands if we're right that the mine and management of Google Ireland's holding offshore makes it disappear from Ireland. 
So if that's true, and it's, it's possible that it, it is true, then Ireland doesn't care about anything above the Netherlands. The only taxpayers that are relevant to Ireland are the one that's operating in Ireland and the one to whom withholdable royalty payments are going to be paid. And so what we have from Ireland's perspective is business income, but it's reduced uh, possibly to zero, I doubt it's to zero, by royalties paid up. And so Ireland taxes the spread between the business income and the royalty payments. Again, simplifying it just additional contracts and obligations. Okay. And there's no withholding tax, I believe, on the, it's been said, on the royalties to the Netherlands because uh, EU, right? So a small spread to Ireland, that's what Ireland sees. Ireland is doing what I would call a classic jobs for taxes trade-off. Okay, we'll give you kind of your tax status, but you'll employ 2,000 people in Ireland that otherwise wouldn't be employed here. It's a good deal for taxpayers. It's a good deal for us as an investment in our job market. Okay, so what does the Netherlands see? Well, the Netherlands sees Bermuda again because now we have another person to whom payments will go. Netherlands sees royalty income coming from Ireland into the BV and, it, and royalty going up and out of this structure and it can theoretically tax the spread. Now this is where that agreement with the Dutch tax authority exists. It plays right here on that tax on the spread and we don't know what that tax on the spread is. I don't know, right? They won't tell us. But that's the right we've, hold, we've held in the Netherlands, the tax on the spread. And the Netherlands does not tax royalty to Bermuda. I'm not sure why, but that's the choice of that jurisdiction to withhold tax or not as an income item leaves its shore. So we see here what the Netherlands sees is a trade-off. Jobs not for salesmen, not for 2,000 salesmen selling advertising, but for maybe five or six lawyers. Sorry, lawyers. But planners, consultants, accountants, right? Not, not sales guys. But it's, again, it's a trade-off. Jobs for those taxes that, that we're giving up to get Google here and to keep this sector alive in the Netherlands. All right, finally, our last player in the structure is Bermuda. What does Bermuda see? Well, Bermuda sees the U.S. again, but Google Ireland is irrelevant to it. Uh, because there's no connection there. Google US reappears in the structure in the sense that Bermuda could, ostensibly, impose source-based withholding on dividends, fees, royalties, etc., paid out from Google Ireland holdings to the US, but it's complicated by the fact that the US doesn't see Bermuda as a company, it sees it as a branch of an Irish company. So that's a little bit uh, strange, to say the least, right? but normal. Don't think it's not normal. All right, uh, so it's a bit of an oddity. But anyway, it doesn't, not likely to be any withholding tax even if we could figure out who the right uh, country is for that, for that corporation. Uh, so what Bermuda sees is royalty income received and CSA fees paid. And again, in the theory, there could be a tax on the spread. I suspect there's no tax on the spread. Otherwise, why would you be there? Uh, but uh, that's the suspicion. The issue here is jurisdictionally, Bermuda has the right to tax that spread if they choose, just the way that Ireland did and Netherlands did below them. And Bermuda uh, could tax payments to the yes, but likely probably does not. And now the trade-off is not, for, not necessarily for jobs, although there are some jobs in the finance sector, but it's capital, capital flowing through Bermuda, so it's the classic capital for taxes trade-off. Get those, get that finance sector in charge. So what's the big picture? If you put all these things together, what do we see? Well, this is how the US sees this structure. This is how Ireland sees it. This is how the Netherlands sees it. And that is how Bermuda sees it. How is this possible? That these four countries see this structure in completely different ways and respond to it in completely different ways. There's a shape shifter, jobs for taxes, jobs for finance, for lawyers, and the jobs for capital all working together through forms, legal forms, and substance that is malleable. And what we get is a, kind of a fragmented world. But the worldwide result is a fully compliant taxpayer. I am not talking about tax evasion. 
I am saying in a fully compliant taxpayer scenario, not even with the CSA. I mean, that's a transfer pricing issue that's been worked out in advance through an advanced pricing agreement. So we don't even have any grounds to complain anywhere along the chain, really. Nominal tax to Ireland, nominal tax to the Netherlands, nominal tax to Bermuda, a growing pile of cash in Bermuda, and nominal tax to the US, perfectly legal, fully compliant. That is how Google can say with a straight face to the Public Accounts Commission or to the press when they ask, yes, we pay a 2.4% tax rate on a global basis and nobody's got that low of a rate. That's true, but we are fully compliant. And what's more, Google is a job creator. You will see those two put together all the time. You, uh, this resonates, right? Don't crucify us. We are fully compliant with the laws. You want someone to be mad at, maybe you should be looking at the lawmaker. It's not our fault, we're compliant. And if we paid more tax than we owed, our shareholders would have a lawsuit against us. So don't be mad at us. We are compliant with the laws and the regulations that have been handed to us. That have been handed to us with our own help in lobbying for them, but yes, okay, but nevertheless, law, it's law, rule of law. All right. Now, I'm going to come back to this form and substance, but I just want to get a sense of how big is this problem. Is this a small problem that I'm talking about? Is this, you know, does this pale in comparison to tax evasion, for example? Illegal offshore tax crime. Well, in the U.S., from the U.S. perspective, we have an estimate of about $600 billion in offshore earnings, $97 billion on offshore taxes paid, which results in about a 16.4% average effective tax rate with obviously some outliers, 2% for Google and so on. But the worldwide rates of US-based multinational companies seem just absurdly low. Something's not adding up. It doesn't add up. So Google, 2.4% worldwide tax rate. Cash offshore currently, 29 billion. Microsoft, 4.7 is estimated 4% worldwide tax rate. Cash offshore, 57 billion. Apple, less than 2%. Estimated, we don't know, right? These are all estimates. Ca uh, worldwide tax rate. Cash offshore, that one is a little bit more known, 82 B billion. GE tax rate, mm, something like seven. Cash offshore, 102 billion. Pfizer, tax rate unknown, cash offshore, 63 billion. So you might say, okay, but you know, you're talking about form and substance. Maybe it's not really money offshore. Maybe it's not real like that. Maybe it's just a paper trail and somehow. But I told you about a holiday before. Well, the last one the U.S. had, 2005, brought back 312 billion tax-free out of the structure that had been created and arranged. This is real money, in other words. It's, it's real money. And it's real money that's escaping tax, not out of evasion, not by setting up secret bank accounts, not by colluding with local uh, uh, incorporation groups or law firms. There's no, there's, it's a different kind of collusion. It's a rule of law collusion, isn't it, really? It's legal, dare I say it, legal evasion, which we are all contributing to. It's rule of law. Okay. Current estimate of U.S. cash reserves offshore, 1.4 trillion. 35% if you tax it right now would be 490 million, which I don't know, it's just, we're just writing numbers down that are meaningless at this point, but if you really could get that, you have a TNI, uh, or sorry, Tax Justice Network figures uh, showing that aggregated globally money hidden in offshore accounts is currently 30, uh, 21 to 32 trillion, T trillion. So this is the U.S. Uh, that's Cash reserve, just cash reserves offshore, not tax evasion, not l l money laundering, not the TJN hidden figure. We're talking about just cash that just ended up trapped in Bermuda. Because if you bring it back, you'll have to pay taxes. Waiting for a tax holiday to come back. Okay, so we're not hiding money is what I'm saying. And the question is how much is not hiding money? This is just the cash reserves uh, for the US. How much is flowing through that structure? I don't know that anyone has done that analysis. I have not seen that analysis. Maybe someone's working it, I don't know. But what I do see is that we're looking at tax evasion a lot, rightfully, 
This is not to minimize tax evasion. We're rightfully looking to enforce the rule of law as written. But there is, in enforcing the rule of law as written, another pile missing, right? Another pile of cash missing. Uh, maybe there's no way to measure it. Now I'm going to come back to this question about form over substance. Why does this happen? Why does it happen that four countries see the same structure for completely different ways to the final result of nominal tax being paid everywhere, money just disappearing in full compliance scenario? Well, I'll submit to you that that's because we do a bunch of things that seem normal because we've always done them. One is that we use documents to identify property ownership, you know, the contract. Just write down what you want to allocate risk, to allocate benefit, to allocate obligation, and most importantly, to allocate ownership. <coughs> it's just a document, and we all respect it. Do we really want to say we're not going to do that anymore? How comfortable are we when we start thinking, OK, we're not going to respect the contract? It's not realistic. The second is that we accept the corporation as a separate taxpayer. We've always done that. The legal fiction. We call it a legal fiction. We know it's a fiction. It's normal. Are we really prepared to say we're no longer going to accept the ta corporation as a separate taxpayer? That, I think, is a, an, an easy place to be. We treat each corporation as if it had a mind of its own. Are we really prepared? to change our assumptions on that front. We treat each corporation as if it can negotiate with other corporations that it controls or that control it. Now, interestingly enough, this is the place where we do see some movement. That's transfer pricing, right? That's where transfer pricing locates itself in terms of the legal regime. It's in here in deciding how much we're going to treat corporations as if they could negotiate with others that control it or that it controls. That is the arm's length question, right? That is, in other words, that's the question or that's the base assumption, the legal fiction that's being tested with arm's length transfer pricing or with, with any kind of transfer pricing regime, right? So we see something we've always done and always sort of implicitly believe being pressured, some stress from without as things go horribly awry, right? We've lost control of arms length. Nobody knows who's pricing what to anything. It's all just nonsense. It's all made up. But the alternative is, uh, what I'm telling you is, the foundation upon which it rests is also fundamentally made up. And we're not prepared to dismount, uh, disassemble that foundation. Right? But we are prepared to test it in some instances, and you see transfer pricing located here. We are prepared to, we, uh, we like to, we, we're accustomed to treating each corporation as if it could bear risk independent of others that it controls or that control it. This is, uh, you know, you'll see this play out a little bit in uh, different rules for interest uh, capitalization, uh, some, other, some other places in the tax code. Being pressured a little bit, but in general, we accept this. This is normal. It's always been this way. Are we really prepared to say that we're going to change the standard for risk? bearing. We treat, finally, we treat products and services as if they can be produced or provided in distinct and independent components along a vertical chain. This goes along with the negotiating, uh, you know, with other corporations point. This is a transfer pricing point. But think about it. <laughs> this is, you can't come to the right answer here. Let's just think about this. Google is selling advertising for a website which is nowhere right? And everywhere, all at the same time. And so what we're saying is that by setting up, I just gave you four pieces of the structure, four companies in four jurisdictions, we can actually disaggregate the product advertising space on Google web pages. We can disaggregate that product and assign a piece of it to each. That that is actually possible and measurable and has any substance more than what we've already done, more or less than what we've already done. I'd say we're in uncharted water, really, to, to, to be there. But to move away from that is not any easier. How else should we see things? How else should we do this? Right. 
Um, I think, uh, Jason, you said, a shell company is just a legal person. Ex precisely. But what other kind of person is there but a legal person outside of, you know, us, humans? Right? That's what we do. The corporate veil, you talked about the corporate veil that screens the beneficial owner. The corporate veil screens a lot. Yes, the beneficial owner, but also a whole structure of how we view law and legal institutions and legal creations and legal fictions. And if you pull that veil across, you have to deal with all of those questions. You can't just choose the one, which is the bad actor, right? The, the one that's high. What was his name? Your guy? Yeah, the first one you started with, the guy you started with. L let's start with an L. The guy who's still, I can't, that's him. Him. That guy. You can't just talk to him. You have to deal with your own view of how you think the state ought to or can treat the corporate entity. Should we do dis just abolish corporations? Because that will solve a lot of our problems. Shall we go away from taxing corporations and just have them be flow-throughs like partnerships? Because that'll solve a lot of our problems. No, it won't. Huh? Lee thinks it will? Well, we'll get to you. <laughs> you, can, you can rebut, I'll allow it. The question at the end of the day though is what is substance, what is form here? It's all form. It's all form in the sense that we can't do really anything without the legal structure that we create to do the things we want to do, right? And so given the norms that we accept as we go about living our daily lives, right? It should not be surprising, but it is in fact surprising that the legal rules and institutions we have developed reflect our underlying norms and assumptions and beliefs. And it's surprising because it took us somewhere we didn't expect it to go, right? We went somewhere we didn't expect to go with all of these norms. They were all perfectly reasonable and rational, and they are still, many of them, still reasonable and rational, but they take us to a place we didn't expect to go. So just to continue, why does this problem exist? Well, it's a function of legal constructs and legalized norms. Legal rules for corporate formation, almost wholly a fiction. The US check the box rules have been called a complete fiction. But I just showed you that actually, in some case, you might say they're more close to the substance than another. But you know, if you have some countries that think that you incorporate where your piece of paper is, and some that say you incorporate where your mind and management, or control, management, control are, well, who is right about that? Uh, legal rules for property ownership. Geographic source rules, completely fictional. I don't know anybody who thinks geographical source rules are grounded in anything but complete legal fictions. There's no substance there. It's just pragmatic decision making forged over many, many years. I'm seeing smiles, so I don't know if that's, uh, I don't know if that's good, like this resonates, or what is she talking about? Fully prepared to back up each and every one of these statements with a well-articulated footnote, I promise. That's what I do. Uh, Legal rules, uh, interest deductible by the legal borrower, no matter where the risk is, you know, all these conventions that we have. Uh, legal contracts and legalized norms for intercompany arrangements. Arms length pricing, wholly fictional, dare I say. Uh, the alternatives, wholly fictional. Formula combined reporting with formula apportionment, probably wholly fictional too, uh, or to some degree. Where's the substance? I'm at a loss myself. Um, we see a plethora also of advanced rulings here. I, sorry, I gotta point the finger at the Netherlands. They seem to be very, very accomplished at the advanced ruling uh, game, uh, where you have the rule of law on paper, and but uh, somehow everybody's doing something else. In fact, how does that happen? I, If you want to, you know, think about the rule of law, I don't know where uh, that, that fits in. But anyway, all of that is undisclosed. So we, the observer, I think Mona talked about the outside person, the public has, a, has an interest in all these things. We can't observe 99% of all of these 
machinations, right? Because they're embedded in competent authority agreements. They're embedded in agreements with your, uh, your tax authority, your home tax authority on your transfer pricing strategy. There are agreements with other countries on various uh, royalty arrangements, various income arrangements, various tax, even tax rate arrangements. Uh, so yeah. But why can't we just look through all of this and come you know, through the forest and start to see the trees? If we disagree, if we got to a place where all these legal constructs and legalized norms took us and we're not happy with where they took us, why can't we undo it? Well, because looking through or undoing it would violate some pretty, I think, serious and contentious norms. One is the corporate law norms. I mean, it's not tax. You know, in some ways, the tax people say, well, look, we got, uh, we've got we're, we're working within a field which is not our construct, corporate law, corporate law statutes, right? The right to the person, that's not, ta that's not our fault. It's not taxes' fault. It's not tax lawyers. You know, you got a problem, talk to the people who write the corporate the business statutes. It's their fault. They let us have corporations, right? <laughs> Um, but so we think that looking through violates this sort of essence, right? Of the corporation is a legal person. The right of the person to confidentiality is another one. I mean, you talked a lot about confidentiality, and there's, I think, more coming. We'll see some this afternoon. It was talked about this morning on, you know, the confidentiality. We have these sort of lo strong norms, and I think we would all agree that some of these we do want. We do not want the state necessarily to be able to pry well, pry unnecessarily into every facet of our lives. And I think that's a, that's a justifiable claim, that, that we humans don't want the state to have that unending and unchecked power. How are we going to regulate that power? And so we have these strong confidentiality norms, but they took us to a place we didn't expect. And now what do we do about that? You can't dial back to a little bit just to get that, that one guy whose name I can't ever remember. But you get, all, you get all of us, right? Now we have uh, closed-circuit uh, television on all of us, right? Um, so there's confidentiality norms that I think people are, rightly, I think, uncomfortable about violating to get to a different tax result, <laughs> right? The tax-driven uh, pro uh, anti-privacy state is a terrifying uh, thing, and I think for good reason for many people. And then finally, sovereignty norms. Uh, and, you know, uh, truthfully, I, I've given many talks on sovereignty and, and really taken issue with the whole concept of sovereignty as it's practiced today because I think we have put a lot into this concept, that uh, a lot into the concept of sovereignty, that the state is the right place to put all these rights. And that we have to respect the state. Now that's another legal fiction that we respect. I mean, there's no, it's raw power, really. There's no sort of normative explanation for the dividing of the world among states. It's, it's a convention in the history, it's power, right? So, and those norms are powerful, they are embedded. And will I say we don't violate these norms ever? Wrong, we violate them all the time. But when we set out on a campaign to violate them for tax reasons, people start to get nervous, right? People start, oh, you, well, you're be this jurisdiction's being overreaching, and that one's being too, you know, too helpful to this sort of taxpayer, and so on. We start, you know, pointing fingers at each other. Who's the worst violator? You know, right? We're all terrible. We're all bad in that sense. Nobody's got clean hands. Uh, none of this, I would say, in the tax world, we can all say none of this is our fault, right? No, it's not our fault that there are sovereignty norms that have preserved relationships between states that take tax to a different place than we would have maybe wanted. It's not our fault that there are confidentiality norms that prevent our governments from doing things we want them to do in this place but not do them over there, right? It's not our fault that there are corporate law norms that go way back and that we're comfortable with and that if you disassembled, uh, we'd feel very uneasy about. It's not our fault, we can say. It's just unexpected consequences. But you're not, in the tax world, going to change any of these things. These are basic norms. So then the question becomes, well, can these rules, standards, and norms be challenged? So if we say it's not our fault, do we say we can't fix it? And I would say you can look at the various substantive policy pro proposals from you know, various 
venerable academics and tax mavens, and they'll tell you about formulary apportionment, and they'll suggest revising the source rules, or they'll give you technical ways out of the thicket, right? And I think we should listen to all that. I don't dismiss any of that. I propose, propose some of my own uh, in, in here and there. But I think what we really need to recognize is that the world we're seeing is fragmented, and we are not seeing a whole picture kind of ever. And even my own descriptions in the slides are missing big, important parts of the story that I've told, and the big, important parts of every story uh, are missing, because we just can't see. It's too fragmented. Uh, there are boxes, and then there are boxes. There are contracts, there are arrangements, there are agreements, there are guarantees. There are back-to-back -back loans, there are all kinds of structures, many of which I'm just not smart enough to understand. I just don't get them. I don't know what they're doing. Uh, and I know they have a play, but somebody else's expertise uh, is at work. And I trust them, right? When I was a lawyer in a law firm, I, I would ask the counsel from another country to help me understand what we were doing. And they would say, don't worry about it. It's just this way. You put this here and that there. And it just works. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you're right, and I'll tell you how to do it from the U.S. perspective because that's what I know, because that's what I've spent years thinking about. And I'm fully compliant, you know, fully compliant taxpayers. Uh, and we saw above that each government has reasons, and I think real reasons, substantive reasons, to see what it sees and not see what it doesn't see, right? And some of these reasons are self-serving. I mean, no, let's, I'm not pretending this is, you know, some sort of principle. This is not principled. I'm not talking about principles. It is self-serving, but it's convenient, it's pragmatic, but it's also just history. Uh, decisions made and stuck to. A path gone down one way. Very hard to diverge. Right? Uh, some theory that takes hold and seems right. But you know, as we say about theory, every theory becomes a part of the thing it theorizes, right? And we're there. I mean, we're absolutely there trying to theorize something that sort of escapes, uh, defies theorization. So we can see, I think, the project of transparency. Uh, it actually tries to re-aggregate, right? It's looking to the people that actually do have the information, notwithstanding the representative they sent to the Public Accounts Commission, there is somebody in the Google organization who understands the structure. Right? It's not the Vice President of European Relations, I can tell you that. <laughs> but there is somebody in the structure who understands, and so the transparency, you know, the publish what you pay, this is the country by country reporting, the, the idea there, I think the compelling idea there, from, from, and I'm not, again, putting aside the tax evasion side of things. A compelling idea for country by country reporting is that the only people that have the information f that explains the world, that draws a picture, are the companies themselves, right? They're the only ones that can draw the picture, pull all these boxes together. Such a project would pull a picture together for us and let us see what's going on. We sort of see it very fuzzy. <coughs> And we might not be able to make things out. That is the problem with disclosure. Uh, we're still in an aggregated, uh, fra or a disaggregated, fragmented world. We've just sort of put the boxes together in a way. We might not be able to make things out. But it's clear to me that governments are going to have to regulate, right? Because the advantages of opt-out for individuals and companies are high, very, very high advantages for opt-out. Lots of arguments, therefore, against disclosure, right? You'll see the arguments against country-by-country uh, country reporting or against publish what you pay from the corporate uh, world. They talk about the costs and the benefits of providing disclosure. It's going to cost a lot. It won't benefit very much. And we are compliant. We, as, uh, as uh, the CEO of GE, or the tax guy at GE, Will Morris, says, we are fully compliant. We pay, uh, we make, we take steps to ensure that we're compliant. So don't worry about us. We're not the bad guy. Go after the bad guy. He's somewhere else, behind a tree, right? Uh, disclosure, though, isn't necessarily, it doesn't have to be about compliance, right? It doesn't have to be about keeping companies honest only. Not to say that's not a big part of it. It doesn't only have to be about that, right? 
companies might be honest, they might be fully compliant, but we still have a complex and multi-jurisdictional world of law and institutions. And uh, we need to bring that into focus for everyone who's a stakeholder. That's the, the goal, I think, and that's, I think, the laudable goal of people who look for public disclosure. Right. Bringing things into focus, well, it's a way to get everyone with a, who has a stake in the outcome, that's all of society, not just governments, not just the companies themselves, and not just their shareholders, right? but the rest of us who have created a monster that we all would like to fight, identify and figure out, why is it such a monster? Right? So we need a way to re-aggregate. And we need to re-aggregate re all the disaggregated parts, organize them, filter them, and make sense of all the info. What we need is some Google goggles. <laughs> right? That's, I think, the project of disclosure. That's giving us Google, go Google, <laughs> Google goggles to start thinking about how to solve the problems. But you can't start thinking about how to solve them until you can see them articulate them first. That's all I have for you. Thank you very much.